Hey everybody, this is Charlie from Be With. Hope you're having a good day. Today's conversation is with Dr. James Hollis. Dr. Hollis is a Jungian analyst, a teacher, and a writer based in Washington, D.C. He's the author of 16 books. He was trained at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich, and he's a very wise man. And we talk about myth, meaning, dreams, the soul's journey throughout life, and a lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. James Hollis. So thank you, Dr. Hollis, for being with me. It's really an honor. Pleasure to be with you, Charlie. So I thought we could start with dreams and um, just sort of explore for a little bit the role of dreams in our lives um, as a way of getting into this conversation. What role do dreams play and how can we work with them? Okay. Well, it's a huge subject, but um, humans have speculated about dreams since the beginning of recorded memory. Um, if you live to 80 years old, as I am currently, you will have spent six full years of your life dreaming, which is an extraordinary uh, factoid. Um, it tells us that nature, for some reason, is spending an awful lot of energy in seeking to uh, process something. I think dreams occur for at least two reasons. One is in our daily lives, we are bombarded with so much stimulation that our system can't process it, can't metabolize it all. So that's what takes us to bed about a third of our lives to try to metabolize that material. So even if we don't remember our dreams, the dreaming activity is, is part of the self-healing and processing system of, of dreams. But secondly, if we pay attention, we realize that there is a symbolic language there, a symbolic life, if you will. And the symbolic language seems to be generated from some center other than ordinary ego consciousness. In other words, we don't generate our dreams. Our dreams come to us. Uh, if, if you think you can, try to order up a certain kind of dream tonight. Say you're going to dream of hamburgers, or you're going to dream of Malibu or something like that. Your psyche is not going to pay any attention to you. It'll, it'll dream according to its own agenda. And if we pay attention to those dreams over time, we begin to understand that that presence is wise, knowing, observant, has a perspective that's different from, and I think larger than the perspectives of ego consciousness, and is commenting on our lives and is soliciting a conversation. Because when we track dreams, we see how dreams evolve over time. I mean, I could give you many examples, but, but people may come into therapy, for example, with a very inflamed relationship, let's say with a parent or, or something of that sort. And that figure starts showing up in their dreams. And over time, you see how that image, that intrapsychic image begins to evolve and to change. I've seen many people, for example, come in even with a parent who's long deceased, and, and their internalized image of that parent, which is what they're carrying, evolves and changes and grows and modifies. And as they assimilate that, it changes their whole relationship to, to that person and to that particular aspect of their history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems as if right now during the COVID crisis, um, many people are experiencing more extreme dream life or more disturbing or more jarring. Mm -hmm. What do you think accounts for that um, elevated state of the dreams? I think for two reasons. One, I think most of all people are probably having a little more time to pay attention to them. In other words, fewer people are rushing off to work or is easily distracted by all the outer activities that they've had before. So they have a little more opportunity to sort of reflect on what was happening. But secondly, uh, any external threat produces an internal response. So, um, you know, <laughs> after the last election, I had a lot of people with dreams that were processing their emotional response to the outcome of that election. And I've certainly had various uh, dreams come from folks that were responding to this COVID threat. Because the irony is, you know, the, the COVID uh, um, uh, virus is so tiny that, that you, it's 10,000 times smaller than a grain of sand, which is, means it's, so, it's invisible to the naked eye, and yet has the power to be lethal to all of us. And, and therefore, it invites all kinds of projections on our part. 
And you can see how that triggers people's complexes, their histories, their fears, their anxieties, their expectations, their search for magic, and, and all of those kinds of things. So, um, you know, our psyche does comment on the outer world because, you know, we're experiencing that's part of our reality. So when we look at dreams, we always try to look at them first from the objective level. In other words, what is this commenting on in terms of your external world? Is it, is it about your family? Is it about what happened at work? Is it about something going on in your society? And, and then we look intrapsychically to see how those images in the dream can be uh, representing certain aspects of ourselves. So let's just say if I dream of my daughter or my son, am I processing something in the outer world with them? Or, or am I, you know, borrowing them from central casting, so to speak, to find, uh, you know, some manifestation, some representation of, of some issue going on within myself? And we approach them at both at the same time, so to speak, because they can be both. Do you think it's intuitive um, how to pay attention to or work with dreams? I ask that because I've been in, in Jungian analysis for about two years. And I would say that what I discovered about being with dreams has evolved in that process. And I realized how much I didn't know before entering into that process. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, do you think we're equipped naturally to know how to work with these or do we need some help and some guidance? Well, we're not equipped in our time, that's for sure. You know, Jung was asked, why are dreams so obscure? He said, is nature trying to conceal itself? And he said, no, nature doesn't conceal. It just speaks with a language of, of imagery that we're not so accustomed to. It's the language of nature. He said, our ancestors who lived in a symbolic world, that trees were not just trees, they were presences in their psychic life, and animals were presences and so forth, and the gods were presences. So they, they had a natural tendency to be able to see things um, in terms of the symbolic expression, whereas we've lived in a materialistic world, a world full of objects of... <laughs> molecules assembling and disassembling, so to speak. So it's almost like we have to come back to learn a different kind of language. In addition, dream work is, is humbling, ultimately. It's not aggrandizing. People like to sort of enter it almost as if it's a parlor game and say, oh, isn't this cool? I can sort of figure out what's really going on in my life and so forth. And, and there's a truth to that. But in the end, dreams will also bring up the things we need to face in our lives, the things that we might have denied by day, or some shadow issues that we haven't been addressing. And, and it's humbling because we're constantly being presented with things that by light of day, we would prefer not to deal with. And, and yet here's the psyche say, well, it hasn't gone away. It's, it's operating somewhere within you and can be influencing your, your choices in your life as well. Yeah. You know, something that stood out to me from my experience without going too deep into it was that there seems to be some kind of narrative arc to my conscious life. And going into the dream work, dream analysis, I also noticed that there seemed to be a sort of parallel narrative arc with its own resolutions and denouement in my dream life, as if there was this other aspect of myself on its own trajectory. Is that a mm -hmm. Is that a common experience? Absolutely, sure. Again, we just have to ask what produces the dreams and, and what produces our symptomatology. Yeah. You know, as we're sitting here talking, I mean, what's digesting your food for you? It's not your conscious life. What's producing all these cellular exchanges? What's producing neurological responses? What's forming ideas and responding emotionally? All of that's happening from other some other kind of autonomous intelligence within you. And Jung's word for that collective intelligence is the self with a capital S, just to distinguish it from the ego. So the ego is a tiny sort of cluster of energy floating on a large ocean, so to speak. It can be easily overwhelmed by the unconscious or by the pressures of the outer world, as we all know, or, or invaded by complexes. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, it's, it's important because it helps us interface with the outer world. The ego's job is to help us interact with the external world, to make choices, be creatures of value, stop at stop signs, and that sort of thing. 
but it's, it's one energy cluster among many. And, and underneath, what is the organic unity of this whole system? There's a layer of, of identity there that, that runs deeper than mind or body or spirit or soul. Those are the categories of the human mind, the intellect to, to discriminate different aspects of it, but it's all one organism. And that single organism is the self that needs to be understood as a verb, not a noun. The self is selving. It's not good English, but what it's really saying is the self is purposive energy. And as far as I can tell, it has two basic agendas. First is self-healing, because life is always wounding and splitting to some degree, but healing the system within us. And, and, and secondly, our growth and development, moving us through the stages of our development, including, to the ego's dismay, aging and mortality just as well. That's part of the self-selfing. Hmm. Yeah, I'm struck by this notion of the encounter with the self, as if it's something that happens. Now, maybe that's a construct in language, but is that a, um, a distinct experience where one encounters the capital S self in some instant or experience, or is that a, just an unfolding process, a metaphor in a sense? I think it's both, and that's a good point. I think, as I said, the self is acting as we speak. It's running all these complex systems. I mean, you and I are not consciously doing that. But from time to time, we have head-on encounters with the self. And Jung said famously, and I've, I'm always moved by this, he said, usually encounters with the self are experiences, defeats for the ego. Now, why would he have said defeat? Well, because the ego thinks I'm the boss, I'm in charge, and here's something else really going on. So, for example, let's say we made a choice yesterday. We, we enacted a certain kind of behavior, and consciously it was the appropriate thing to do. But let's say we have a, a dream that critiques it. That's not uncommon in dreams to critique our, our lives. And then we'd have to say it wasn't what I did. It's what it was in service to inside of me that made all the difference. So what it was inside of me might have been a less noble motive, right? It mm -hmm. may have come from an infantile part of me. It might have come from a frightened part of me. It might have come from a part that was avoidant and, and, and um, you know, <laughs> seeking to avoid conflict at any point. Who knows where it came from, but maybe the dream will reveal that. So part of the archaeology of our self-investigations is to begin to discern from whence are my behaviors coming. Coming, I've often said to people, um, whether you're in analysis or not, you don't have to be, to start this examination, the first place to look is your life patterns. You know, you don't rise in the morning and look in the mirror while you're brushing your teeth and saying, well, today I'm going to do the same stupid and counterproductive things I've done for decades, but there's a good chance we will. So what we're really saying there is, all right, what's generating those patterns? In other words, there's certain energy clusters that produce the patterns we have where we abide with our stuckness or we engage in behavior counter to our legitimate best interests or or even hurtful to other people. And then to realize we don't do crazy things, we do logical things, if we understand the emotional premise that it's in service to inside. Now that premise could come from long ago and far away, that premise could be tied up with some other kind of agenda of which I'm essentially unaware, but what I've done is express the logic of that premise. And the problem is, it's unconscious, it's operating autonomously. But this is one of the ways we begin to undertake that difficult project, which is dialoguing with the unconscious. And what's difficult is it's unconscious, so we don't know what it's about. But with that, we can begin to sort of explore what other sort of systems and energies are going on inside of each of us. Hmm. How does trust factor into it? And that's, that's a question that comes to me is, can we trust these forces or this unconscious mechanism or the deeper psyche? Can we, so to speak, leap into that void and trust that it will support us or that it's guiding us in mm -hmm. a helpful way? 
Well, you're asking good questions here, Charlie. <laughs> you certainly are. Um, I want to congratulate you for asking the right questions. Um, first of all, there are many voices within. I think it was in the Bible, I forget where, I think it was Jesus who talked about testing the spirits at one point. When something comes to me, a motive, an impulse, a, 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 a decision, where is it coming from? In me? That's the key. That's the testing of the spirit. That's, that's a discernment of from whence it comes. That's why I said the real question is not what I do, but where is it coming from inside me? Mm. But having then addressed that question, you, you, you then have to realize, okay, there is something in me that knows what's right for me, has my interests at heart, not necessarily having my cultural interests at heart. That is to say, it's not necessarily about fitting in or being more adjusted. Because if the world is crazy and I'm adjusted to it, what does that make me? That, that in, in a sense, the activity of the self is really the activity of nature. As Freud pointed out so succinctly, the price of civilization is neurosis, meaning we have two agendas that we're always com finding competing within us. The, the claims of our external culture from family of origin to popular culture and religion and education and so forth. And then the claim of our own instinctual nature. And the more divergent their agendas, the deeper the split we feel, of course. So in, in addressing your basic question, is there something that supports us? <clears throat> and the answer is yes, it's our essential nature. But it's not necessarily here to make our life comfortable. It's here to live this journey as full as it can. For that reason, I've, I've often spoken about the differing agendas that we face at differing points in our lives. And in the first half of life, speaking very you know, generally, um, we have to, to address the question, what does the world want from me? What do my parents want from me? What does the school teacher want from me? What, is, what does the employer want from me? What does my partner want from me? What does the culture want from me? And to mobilize enough energy in the ego world to enter that world and create a life, a professional life. And if a truck drives over us on, let's say our 35th or 40th birthday, we might have lived a productive, albeit short life, but have served the agendas of our culture, of our world. Would we have served the agendas of our soul? That's a different matter. And the second half of life, then one has to say, all right, having created now enough of a provisional identity of ego accomplishment, <clears throat> I then have to ask a larger question, but why am I here really? What's my life in service to really? Am I just to be, you know, an economic cog in a big system? Am I simply to be a vehicle for the reproduction of the next generation, which is important, but you know, what am I here for really? And just as the question of the first half of life is, what is the world asking of me? So the question of the second half, I would say, is more what is wanting to enter the world through me, which is a different matter. Another way of putting that is, what is worthy of my service from here on? Am I going to be just a wage slave? Am I, I just going to be a creature of respondings to the relational demands around me, which are very real and very palpable? Or am I in some way uh, uh, going to submit myself to the expression of something that is wishing um, more life through me? You know, our particular talents and our callings and so forth, which may have little support in the popular culture. And therefore, and, you know, throughout history, most people haven't had that privilege. They, they've been sort of obliged to deal with the harshness of daily life, putting food on the table and so forth. Or or in rep repressive circumstances, which allowed no personal expression. But increasingly, at least in the Western world, in the advanced uh, civilizations, economically and culturally and educationally and medically and so forth, there's been greater opportunity for people in some way to live a life that is expressing what is wanting expression through them. So uh, again, when, when we say, why am I here? I mean, that's the enduring question. A child thinks about it. After a while, we forget asking that question because we're responding to all the demands of daily life. And we pick up so many 
patterns and so many conditioned responses that one could live theoretically an entire life doing nothing but reacting to stimulus response, stimulus response. Soren Kierkegaard mentioned in the 19th century, a, 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 a citizen of Copenhagen who read the morning newspaper and was shocked to find that his, his name was in the obituary column because he hadn't realized he had died and he'd never realized he'd really been there. You know? So the, the, the question is, why am I here and in service to what? And it's got to be something more than just fitting into the world around me. Yeah. It was very um, hopeful to learn about your journey a little bit and how you came to analysis and, and becoming a psychotherapist relatively late in life and how you've produced so many incredible books in these last 20, 25 years, uh, a testament to the ongoing journey and evolution. Um, but I want to ask you, it's pretty obvious that things are accelerating in our world um, technologically and in many, many ways. And it seems to me that one of the consequences of that acceleration is that this urgency to uh, find meaning and sort of and perhaps enter into the second half of life, metaphorically speaking, perhaps is happening sooner and sooner for people. Uh, I'm 33 and friends of mine who are in their early 20s or even teens are many, many of them struggling with existential mm -hmm. questions and also men mental health issues. Yes. And I'm wondering if, if you've noticed or if you have any comments on the result of this acceleration or this moment and how things have shifted for, for younger people. Sure, it's a very complex question. Um, first of all, I remember being those ages and having many of the same questions, but I also felt them, as young people often do, are overruled by the need to you know, get an education, find a profession, establish relationship, that kind of thing. All good things, I, I wanted to emphasize. Um, and I had more or less achieved those things before age 30. And then in my early 30s, just where you actually at roughly at 33, I, I experienced a depression. And, and it's the first time in which I felt that I wasn't sort of running my own choices and, and something had reached up and pulled me down. And that's what led me to my first hour of therapy at, age 35, little knowing I was starting a, a different journey. So one of the things I didn't mention a while ago is just as the self produces dreams, it also produces psychopathology. And if we examine the etymology of the word psychopathology, it means literally the expression of the suffering of the soul, which rather than just medicate it, which is the way our culture you know, attempts to deal with it or outrun it through sort of behavioral means, we should rather ask the question, why has it come? And what is it asking of me? And, and that's a different kind of question. Again, that brings the ego back to the table in a humble position to say, all right, what is life asking of me? And, and, and when you do that, th then you begin your own journey. Now, on the other hand, as you've suggested, you know, we're drowning in data. Data is not knowledge. Knowledge is fairly hard to get hold of. Is, and wisdom, which is understanding what the knowledge really ultimately means, is even rarer. So we're, we're going through a time in which the cultural norms, the paradigms, what I'll call the fixities of life are breaking apart. That happens periodically in cultures. And, and when it does, it throws people back upon their own resources on the one hand, or upon the diminishing resources of popular culture. And the, the, the chief treatment plans of our popular Western culture has been materialism to fill that ache inside of you. You go buying things. And if that worked, we would know it by now. Narcissism, it's all about self-absorption. And, and thirdly, uh, hedonism is all about having a good time. Now, there's a bankruptcy to all of those. I think at some level, we all know that. 
And yet they're still very appealing, especially in the absence of seeming alternatives. But I think what happens during those moments is it shakes out people from the collective into an encounter, perhaps uh, a welcome encounter with the reality of their own soul. And, and by soul, I mean, that's the literal translation of the word psyche. So it's like, wh whatever I am, it is found in my psyche, not in my ego contents. So to, to go back a, a couple of paragraphs from an earlier conversation, Jung always said, we all need to find what supports us when nothing supports us. That's a profound task. And it will vary from time to time in our lives. What supports you when nothing supports you? Now, I can tell you, and I mean this completely, when I need to know what's right for me, whether it's something mundane like how to approach a, a, a new piece of writing or how to, uh, how to respond to a, a, a difficult case or something like that, or whether it's a large question about life, I sort of put it in there metaphorically downstairs. And you may not know this, but there's a whole group of little folks running around down there in, in the solar plexus, and, and they work all around the clock. And, and they work on these things, and they always get back to me. May not be on my desk at four o'clock this afternoon, as I want to report. It'll wake me two days from now with a dream, or at three in the morning with insight. Or I'm driving a car and suddenly something falls into place. It, it, it demonstrates that there's a whole realm of the unconscious that is working on our life and is seeking its perspective, its resolution to these things. Now, you can't force that. It's, again, humbling to have to wait upon that. It's humbling to, to realize the answers that you get may not be what you want. It's rather what your, your deeper nature wants from you. Now, talk is cheap. This is also, at times, the dark night of the soul that the ancients have talked about in so many different ways. So one goes through difficult times of in-betweenness. You know, my, my last book, it was originally going to be called In Between Times. And the publisher thought, well, it's probably not sexy enough title, so it's Living Between Worlds subtitled Finding Resilience in, in Changing Times, because whenever your outer world changes, you have to ask the question, what, what abides within amid this change? What persists during transitions? What can I count on? And historically, what people could count on were their tribal religions and mythologies, their sacred institutions. And that's still true for many people. But for many others, that's no longer the case, and they're thrown back upon the resources of popular culture, and good luck with that. So for some people, this is an invitation to personal exploration and, and to realize, once again, there's something inside of me that knows what's right for me. And if I pay attention in a disciplined way, over time, it will speak to me. Then I have to mobilize the courage to live it you know, and live it over time. As, as Jung said once in a letter in the 1950s, he said, psychology can only help us with the first part, and that's to give us some insight. He said, then come the moral qualities of the individual. Second is courage to face whatever life brings us. And thirdly, he said, is endurance over time. That's how you live your way through difficult passages. And that's what we're going through is a passage whether it's a personal passage or a cultural passage. No one can say where we're headed. As Yeats wrote, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Matthew Arnold in the late 19th century, we wander between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born. I mean, sensitive observers have been realizing for the last couple of centuries that the old order has shaken apart. We live in the wasteland. We live in the postmodern era. And in that, the shift of meaning has uh, occurred from the tribe to the shoulders of the individual. Therefore, the single biggest project for each person 
is the attainment of or recovery of personal authority. As you sort through the traffic, outer and inner, which pieces of that speak to you at the most deep level, the deepest level? Which ones resonate for you? The others may be well-intended or not, but they're someone else's journey, someone else's life. Which ones speak to you? And, and that is, on the one hand, for some people, and a terrifying accountability, a, a frightening summons. For others, it's an opportunity for great personal dignity. And, and f- I've often said to people in, in analysis, this is not about curing you. You're not a disease. This is about having a more interesting journey, seeing that your life is, is far more interesting than you thought. It's the most fascinating novel you've ever read. And every page at some level, you're invited to contribute to the unfolding of the plot. Something inside of you is wanting to unfold. And you're contributing to that one way or the other. So to see it that way brings a certain measure of drama and, as I said, accountability to a person's journey. Mm. Yeah, this crisis of meaning feels acute in this wasteland of postmodernity. Mm. And I wonder if you have an intuition about whether meaning is intrinsic or extrinsic and how the kind of greater intelligence of the psyche or the collective which seems to have its own sense of meaning, maybe that's too broad, Uh, how that collective meaning or intelligence interacts with the individual personal meaning. And do we create meaning from nothing or is there some innate and inherent Mm -hmm. value? Mm Well, those are mysteries, Charlie. <laughs> Once again, you ask a really good question. Uh, folks have wrestled with that for thousands of years, literally. Uh, Jung would argue, and I concur, that there is an inherent wisdom in each of us. And I used a word a few moments ago, resonance. When we find in the outer world something that aligns with our inner world, we feel that resonance. Others may mean well, or we may have imposed upon us values, choices, issues, and so forth. But if it doesn't resonate for us, then it's not for us. And you can't will that into being. It's kind of like saying, well, I found this wonderful new food group, and I'm going to insist that you like it. You'd say, well, that's ridiculous. I have my own inherent tastes, and indeed you do. So one food group will resonate for one person and another for another. Another important word here is this word numinous, not a daily word necessarily. It comes from the Latin verb that means to nod or beckon. So the numinous is something that summons us. So let's say that two people move, walk into a, an art museum and one person passes by a certain painting unmoved and moves down the corridor. The other person stops and is hooked by it and begins to weep, let's say, or or is deeply moved to reverence. Now, which one of them is right? Well, that's a ridiculous question because the numinous is that within the painting. It's only an arrangement of pigments on a canvas, after all. But something of the human spirit entered that in the creative process that rendered it more than daubs of paint on a canvas. It carries the numinous, and and that numinous touches one person, but not the other. So part of how we have to live our journey is to follow the numinous. Jung said, ultimately, our our resolutions of our central issues are, are not found in cures or solutions as much as the engagement with the numinous, which is that which helps us reframe our experience much of which will remain essentially in mystery. So when we think about, all right, how do I solve life's dilemmas? Well, you don't solve them. You, you live them as faithfully and as honestly as you can. It's the best you can do. Now, along the way, if you reflect upon what speaks to you, what causes resonance, what, what do you experience as the numinous? And it's sometimes found in our engagement with other people, for example, 
uh, as a therapist. Um, I can't say I enjoy listening hour after hour to human suffering. At the same time, I, I find that that kind of conversation and working with their dreams and so forth engages me with the numinous. And that that's, that's something that gives energy and gives purpose and meaning. And I, I find it such a rich conversation, I can't imagine ending it. When you, would you say that enjoyment and, and this sense of engaging with the numinous don't have to go hand in hand? I would say that, yeah. I mean, I, for example, um, one of the, the most fatuous ideas that our culture has is we're supposed to be happy all the time. And there's something wrong. I mean, I know people who are depressed because they're not happy. You know, it's kind of like a New Yorker joke. Um, happiness is transient and it's contextual. And when we're in right relationship to our souls in any given moment, we can be flooded with that emotion we call happy. But happiness is not something you can grab hold of and hold on forever. My work makes me happy. The actual experience of it often is heart wrenching. Now, how do you explain those contradictions? Well, <laughs> It's only a contradiction to the ego. The, the soul knows to be engaged with something that is meaningful to you is, is, is going to make you happy from time to time. Let's see if I can make this leap. But what, what comes to my mind is, so you're talking about your, your example of the two people in the, in the gallery responding to different things. <laughs> makes me think of this idea of the observer is the observed and creating the observed and the relationship between what, what we uh, bring forth as individuals into our relationship with the world. And, and then I wonder how we, func how we have even function as a society or a civilization when we all have such different experiences of the numinous or of mm -hmm. meaning or of reality. And, mm -hmm. and we're living in this kind of, um, uncertain myth right now, or perhaps the myth is changing that we're all living within. So how do we course correct? Well, good question. Uh, first of all, um, it's those very differences that provide the richness of life. I mean, if you think about this as a um, large mosaic, we're not supposed to necessarily agree we're supposed to bring our individual chip to the great mosaic of life. And if I don't live my journey, I've removed that chip from the totality. And I, I think that's what each person needs to see that I, I don't have to understand the total mosaic to realize that what I have to do is bring to life. What is again, within me wishing expression in this world. So, you know, we're, we're going through, a time of the sort of deconstruction of what we'll call fixities. For example, when, when I was a child, my parents believed that there were fixed categories, let's say of gender, that what, you, what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a man was pretty circumscribed. You had marching orders, things you could do, things you couldn't do. With that came certainty and clarity. And yet, often terrible deformations of the human soul, both for women and for men. And as we've, our society has been deconstructing those fixed beliefs, and, and, and my parents would have believed that those fixities, those categories, came either from divinity or were in the nature of nature. Today, we understand them to be social constructs, and social constructs can be deconstructed. And this has freed up women to live a richer life. And it's beginning to free up men to live a richer life. The same is true of fixities of religion, of ethnicity, and social and, and sexual identity and practices and so forth, and normative en uh, ethics and, and um, ethics that are situational and so forth. So it's an exciting time. <laughs> if it doesn't kill you, it's an exciting time because the ice flow is, is broken up. Whether it will take us, I don't know. Now, there are enormous dangers there. The dangers in times of cultural fragmentation is that people call out for strong leaders. They call out for often those who bring the new order, whatever it may be. Well, the new order is not necessarily going to be any wiser than the old order. It's just going to be different. 
and it too will produce its totalitarian expectations. That's why, that's why we can't just sort of naively look to the future where everything is bright and better. It all depends on how things play out and how each of us grows enough to be able to see through it and to reject it when it's, it's not going to in some way support the development of our humanity, but rather is, you know, sacrificing that in, in service to order and clarity, which is what, you know, bound cultures together, but often at huge, huge price for folks. Right. Yeah, when I think of humans settling Mars, I'm reminded of Confucius saying, everywhere I go, there I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure, because, you know, one, this is going to sound cynical, but one thing you can count on, if humans are involved, somebody's going to screw it up sooner or later. And that's why utopias don't particular, to particularly work. And that's because people bring into the ideal society, whatever it may be, the, you know, their fractured personalities and their complexes and their projections onto each other and their hidden agendas. And that's what tears every Edenic state apart sooner or later. There is huge wisdom in the founding of the American system, which recognized the capacity for corruptibility and produced our balance of powers. It has been to my dismay and the dismay of others to see how those balancing powers have often been um, jimmied, if you will, how, how they've often been abused and they haven't worked as well as frankly, I would have expected them to work, but, but it was based upon a perspective. I mean, the 18th century figures who were creating our system made many mistakes, but they got a few things right. And one of the things they saw was you can't count upon individuals who are given power not to abuse it. Therefore, you have to have corrections for that power and, and to build that into the system and, and to feel that in the long run, the ballot box is the best place for those correctives. So, you know, it's a wise system, imperfect in its application, but uh, let's, let's hope that it works. Mm. Mm. So winding down now, I think we've covered so much wonderful ground. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Um, I was struck by, by this quotation in, in your book on this journey we call our life. Um, where you said, I believe consciousness matters, but if push came to shove, I would put compassion first, imagination second, and consciousness third. Mm -hmm. And um, many of the conversations I've been having have been around the subject of consciousness from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I would just, I would love to close with maybe a little more about, about that quotation, how you came to that hierarchy and sure 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 i think i would have uh, at your age believe consciousness itself was prized over everything because i believed at that time that one could attain enough consciousness to make proper choices i i've since learned often the hard way and through observation that um, consciousness is often informed by complexes uh, hidden agendas, <laughs> biological data, um, a thousand influences. And again, the ego is a very fragile and easily invaded state. So I can't always depend upon consciousness to make proper decisions. If, if we could, the world would be a better place to live. But what in the end matters to me most is compassion. I've always been moved by the observation of Philo of Alexandria from a little over two millennia ago, he said, be kind. Everyone you meet has a really big problem. And I think about that every day. And that helps soften my heart to the things I see around me. And to realize people are coming out of their fear-based responses most of the time. And if I can remember that and, and, and try to be able to address those fears uh, out of a spirit of compassion, and, and by the way, compassion, passio is Latin for suffering. So compassion means I have to be able to, at some level, and this is where imagination comes in, I have to be able to imagine 
getting outside this sack of skin into the experience of someone else and to realize what they're suffering or where they're coming from or how they're frightened. And this is their response to their fear. And out of that, I get a consciousness that is the byproduct of compassion and, and imagination. So um, that's, that's what I would say in terms of the second half of life I've, I've had to learn that consciousness itself is fragile, easily invaded, easily persuaded that it knows what it knows and what it knows is sufficient. When most of the time what it doesn't know is what's working on it, which is why we're constantly being humbled. That's again why Jung said, often the encounters with the self are experiences defeats for the ego. Mm. Well, I'm glad that I know enough to talk to someone like you and hear some of your wisdom. Thank well, you so good much. Talk to you, Charlie. You, you've asked some brilliant questions and I'm grateful. And maybe the future is in good hands. So That's be nice to think. Yeah. Is there anything else that, that you wanted to, to say before we, we end or that? No, on? that's fine for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollis. It's been a real You're pleasure. Welcome. You're welcome and I wish you well. You too. Have a great Have day. Fun.